Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar on heavy-duty electric vehicles for waste collection and uh, street cleaning. This is part of our cycle on webinars, which aims to <coughs> spread the results, the outcome of the Big Buyers project. Um, we, we are really happy to have uh, so many people with us today. We have uh, over 100 uh, people registered from many different uh, cities and administrations in, in the EU. So we really look forward for the presentation from our experts, which have been involved in the heavy duty uh, vehicles working group of the Big Buyers project. Um, let's move to the um, housekeeping rules. So the, um, please mute, mute your mic and switch off the camera. Uh, to submit your questions, you can use uh, our app Slido. Um, we will read the questions and invite the relevant speaker to address, uh, to answer to, to them. Uh, please identify yourself when you are asking a question and please also indicate uh, to which speaker this is, uh, the question is going to be addressed. If there is any question which remains unanswered, we will also gather them and answer them in our LinkedIn group, Agents of Innovation Procurement. Uh, the link will be uh, also shown at the end of this webinar. And if you have any technical problems, of course, please write us in, in the chat. Next. So I want uh, to start, uh, introduce uh, the, the relevant uh, speakers. We have uh, um, Anya Kathleen De Kunto. Uh, she is a team leader on food, and she has been uh, handling and managing uh, successfully the working group on heavy duty electric vehicles, uh, which we are discussing uh, today. Uh, together with her, we have also Peter Arns, strategic advisor um, at Sustainable Waste and Water, Division of Waste from the city of Gothenburg. Um, today's um, webinar has uh, two, two essential objectives. So, as I was saying before, to share the results of the heavy duty electric vehicles working group and also to explain to the participants how they can take part in the new Big Buyers project, which, is just, uh, which has just been launched. So, in order to reach this objective, uh, we have divided the meeting in three parts. The first will be uh, the introduction of the topics by our distinguished speakers. Then it's going to, have, then it's going to be the time of the Q&A session via Slido. And then the presentation of the next the Big Buyers project. So uh, without any further ado, I would uh, pass the floor to Anya for her presentation. Anya, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivo, and uh, thank everybody uh, for joining us today. So my name is Anja de Kunto, as uh, correctly introduced by Ivo, and I had the pleasure to follow the working group uh, focusing on heavy-duty electric vehicles now for the last uh, three years of their activities. So I'm happy to present the results of the work that we have been doing. Uh, before we start, I wanted to simply say why it was so important for us to get together. Because what we are really seeing in, as part of the big buyers in the last three years of work is that it is really necessary to come together to drive the market when it comes to innovative and sustainable goods and services. It is true, sometimes the market also comes around. We have met with quite some companies that, of course, also have an interest in producing vehicles that are cleaner or are more innovative. On the other hand, they really need this market dialogue and collaboration with those that are using and procuring the vehicles, or in this case, the vehicles or the, the sustainable goods and service, to really understand how to move and where to move. And sometimes uh, um, it, it seemed that it was just maybe one entity interested in procuring a certain service, but by coming together, the market has really realized that is no, it is actually many, and in this case, cities across Europe that have an interest to buy specific products. So it's really, it was really a strategic collaboration, and I think we have had quite some success that I'm happy to present to you today. In the last uh, three years, we have been focusing on four areas of collaboration, zero emission construction site that I know you had a webinar just a couple of weeks ago to understand what they've been working on and what they have achieving. A circular construction working group that focused in particular on asphalt and cement uh, for construction uh, work. Then we had a working group focusing on digital solution for the healthcare sector and the topic of today, electric heavy duty vehicles. Uh, what is important to note is that these areas of collaboration were really chosen in a bottom up way 
by the buyers that really understood and saw the potential and added value of collaborating in these areas of work. So for today, heavy duty electric vehicles, what do we mean? We mean everything that is waste trucks, but also street cleaning and everything that has to do with heavy delivery, for example, for construction, sand and stones and, and rocks. Um, it is also two different areas of work. On one hand, we were looking at acquisitions of new vehicles. And on the other hand, we were looking at opportunities to retrofit current vehicles. And this is because, as I will share later, new vehicles are still quite expensive. And also, well, if we look at the entire life cycle assessment of vehicles, if there is an opportunity for retrofitting, of course, it will be better in the short term. And who was involved in, in this collaboration? Well, in this case, heavy duty electric vehicles and waste collection is, put, is mainly a competence of cities. Um, so we had in the lead Rotterdam, but we also had very strong collaboration with Amsterdam, Oslo, the city of Cologne in Germany, Helsinki, Gothenburg. Peter will, will share with us today the work. And we also had Lisbon and Porto, really, um, and also a number of other entities that were interested in collaborating and getting involved. So what was the added value? Why we decided it was really important for us to work? Well, I think as many of you are, are aware, we have really a problem that we need to dec decarbonize the transport sector. We, it, it, we know it's one of the main responsible for CO2 emission, for greenhouse gas emission, for air quality, for noise. And many of the cities, especially that I mentioned, have already uh, the ambition to become climate neutral by 2030. Uh, so they really need to dec decarbonize. Uh, many of the cities have already gone uh, to the decarbonization of the smaller vehicles, vehicles like cars, vehicles like uh, smaller um, opportunities for street cleaning or in city centers. This did not pose a big challenge. However, what is really the challenge is the heavy duty sector. Also, what we saw is that uh, we, we want to create a common market in the European Union. Union. There is quite some, some work still to be done because we have noticed that uh, there is quite a lot of market options in certain countries of Europe, but other peripheral, especially the peripheral regions like Norway or, or Portugal, they said that they, are, um, they really lack opportunities to buy certain kind of products. And I will explain also a little bit later why. What is also um, important is that, as we see, there was really an added value from the companies to get in touch with us, to, to work with us, or to work directly with the, with the entities, because this supports their research and development efforts to really understand what, what they need, still need to do, how they need to improve their vehicles. So this was really, I think, the basics. So let me go towards what we have done and why it was important. Um, of course, it's always like this, but the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, ju no, just a little bit more on the advantages of why it was important to work together and not for each single entity to, 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 to have a single dialogue. On one hand, we are looking at higher purchasing power to work jointly for the market consultation. You could also share information on new technologies, on new availability of products, their performance, if they work correctly or if they didn't work correctly. Um, you also, we could also share life cycle assessment methodologies, um, the questions that you can ask the market, the procurement criteria, and above all, how to evaluate and compare the different tender offers. And for the companies, uh, it was really important to understand which entities were planning to buy um, and, and what are their needs and challenges. Um, the, today, I will focus really on the last two years of work, but it's important to notice that we already have started three years ago, so uh, we already had developed quite a lot of uh, key takeaways and lessons learned. And the takeaways that I present today, it's something really they should be seen as a continuation of the work, so they should be seen as an integrated uh, document of the first one we had produced. Uh, uh, also, I've added, uh, is there a future for this collaboration? It will be interesting to know later, and I'm sure Ivo will present future opportunities. So, the, let me focus then now on the lesson learned and why it was really important. What we have noticed, and Peter will also showcase this later when it comes to the, the case of Sweden, we have seen that entities that have been able to implement uh, such vehicles, the heavy duty, the, the electric vehicles, uh, are usually in a country where there is already a stronger presence of producers. Uh, 
uh, they have created really a strong relationship because for this vehicle, many of them still do not work as, as good as their uh, counterpart, their uh, biodiesel or diesel counterpart. So there is, you need to have a very strong relationship between the seller and the buyer. And we have noticed usually it is a little bit easier uh, in, in really in those countries where you have quite uh, the, the supplier ready. Um, also something that we've learned from, from few cities, and I will present later the case of Rotterdam, because these vehicles still do not work as good as their diesel counterpart, or there could be challenges that needs to be solved, it is important that you can use piloting of solutions. So you can purchase uh, different vehicles all in one entity, in one quantity, so that you can test all the different performance and put them into comp comparison. And to do so, this is something the city of Rotterdam has done. They really use mini competition and they use the, um, uh, ex uh, the clause, the exception clause uh, for innovation procurement that does not require to open the tendering but you can really go and purchase one vehicle directly. And Rotterdam says that until now, none of the suppliers have complained because they understand that they are in a relationship where the vehicles are still being tested. Then something extremely important that we have understood because the vehicles work very differently compared again to the diesel counterpart or the biogas counterpart, it is necessary to constantly collect data on their performance and also collect data on batteries, how much they need to be recharging. And I'm sure here Peter will explain quite a lot the difference that needs to be, for example, in the planning for the waste collection. So sometimes in certain cities, um, having these vehicles will require a completely reshuffle on the structure and the way in which they collect waste or they clean uh, the street. Finally, what we've learned it's all about people. It's all about uh, getting in touch with the people, the service provider, the companies that will need to use the vehicles. Most of the time, cities do not purchase vehicles directly, uh, but they really purchase the service for waste collection and street cleaning. So it's all about getting in touch with the companies that will provide such a service, with the people that will drive these vehicles, uh, if they have any doubts, if they feel there is some challenge, if they feel they're not as good. Uh, sometimes they, they could be some uh, reticence. So uh, the city entities have really invested a lot in this dialogue, not only with the market, those providing the vehicles, but also with the operators of the service and really the drivers that also might require new training to use good uh, these vehicles perfectly. So this is a little bit about the lesson learned. And indeed, uh, um, I wanted to mention the Article 32 of the European legislation, 94, 114, that is the one that has been using, um, Rotterdam has been using to drive this mini competition to really test the different vehicles on the ground before committing to purchase further to uh, kind of normal tendering. So this is the use. shared really uh, about the work of Rotterdam, among others. So another interesting document that we have been working on is a joint statement of demand and the market gaps for analysis. So really, we wanted to communicate to the market on one hand, uh, what we are planning to buy as, as uh, public buyers, uh, when, what will be the, the aggregated procurement plans, and on the other hand, what is missing from their side for making it as interesting as possible for buyers to move towards electric heavy duty vehicles. So, and as you can see here from the numbers, as I mentioned before, when it comes to electrification of smaller vehicles like bicycles, scooters, passenger cars, um, there, there is no, there seems to be really less, less, less challenges compared to when we look at light commercial vehicles or heavy sweepers or, or especially the trucks, which are the biggest, biggest challenge. So this is uh, now we'll go in the in the detail of this market gaps uh, document that we have produced. But before I should also mention we have uh, uh, done a very interesting collaboration with the Entrance project that is a project financed by Horizon uh, 2020, and they've also about they also have similar interest as us about the uh, electrification of. Um, of the transport sector, and they've helped us also done an analysis of uh, all the all the trucks, the heavy duty vehicles currently available on the market, or the next one that are coming to commercialization. What is also interesting is also thanks to us and all the market dialogues that we have done with a number of these companies, we were able to compare all the different um, 
um, performance of the vehicles because it's still important to understand if these vehicles will be able to fit to the needs of the buyers. So we have done uh, conversation with a number of these companies, in particular Volvo, DAF, Iveco, uh, Bücher Municipal, but also Dulevo. These are all companies we have got in touch and we were able really to discuss together um, about their vehicles, about their future plans, also where technology is heading. So why do we still don't see such a development of electric heavy duty vehicles? Well, simply the total cost of ownership compared to the diesel equivalent, compared to unfortunately still some limitations such as range constraint, the running time, the losses when it comes to payload, for example, when you're collecting waste, of course, the battery, uh, the, the entire vehicle becomes heavier, so it is still uh, not performing as good. These are some of the main factors that are really hindering the transition to zero emission vehicles. Total cost of ownership is not the only reason. There is also quite a lot in relation, of course, to policy and policy related to energy. To run electric heavy duty vehicles, we need to have a strong energy policy. And as you all know right now, uh, energy prices are really uh, becoming problematic for this point of view. So I will go in the detail of the market gaps that we have identified. As anticipated before, what is really important is the data and the planning operation. These vehicles might not be able to perform as long or uh, to perform in all uh, parts of the cities, for example, when there is a condition related to geographical lot of snow or is very cold or it's a lot of uh, uh, up and down, as in the case of Lisbon and Portugal. Uh, it, it's, you need really strong data, data and completely sometimes it might be necessary to completely replan the waste collection. Also something that we've noticed, and it was very much a result, unfortunately, of the COVID circumstances that many of these companies have extremely late delivery time. Uh, we, um, all companies are experiencing issues in the supply chain, but for the delivery of some of these heavy duty electric trucks, the time can be even more than one year. And this is something to take into consideration because, for example, Oslo was preparing their tendering contract and they realized that by the time the vehicles they had requested would have been delivered, they might have already the necessity to launch a new tender. So what they decided to simply anticipate already and, and increase the number of trucks that they were going to buy. Uh, so, and, and However, what is important that many companies have said that they are prioritizing the delivery of electric vehicles over the diesel counterpart. So it's also interesting. Um, then what is very important? When you buy a vehicle, as I said, there could be challenges, there could be, of course, needs uh, in relation to repairing. This is the, something that every vehicle says. But when it comes to electric heavy duty vehicles, not many companies can offer after sales support, particularly in certain countries, like I said, peripheral region. There is quite a lot of need to, to invest in skilling. Um, companies, maybe startups or SMEs, in doing the, this after sales support. What is also interesting for the dismantling of the vehicles afterwards, there is still quite a lack of skills when it comes to this. Batteries, uh, the current battery generation does not, unfortunately, still not good enough. What we know is that we need to wait for new battery generation, batteries that uh, are um, probably lighter, they need to be lighter and they need to be stronger in power because at the moment, the current batteries, especially if uh, we have a vehicles that, for example, has a crane operators, will not be able to satisfy. So, however, we have been told by many companies that the new battery generation is not too far. So, um, which could also mean that some entities will need to delay their procurement uh, because of waiting for new vehicles and new quality. And as mentioned, well, probably one of the biggest uh, things that is hindering the, the, the current the purchasing of electric vehicles is energy production and recharging infrastructure. And here, what we also want to avoid is lock-in solutions, uh, but um, this is unfortunately something that we have seen quite a lot. Um, depending on the recharging infrastructure that the entities have put in place, either they will need to invest in new infrastructure or they will need to have vehicles that are able to satisfy uh, all the different recharging solutions. And again, Peter, I know he will discuss quite a lot in relation to that. Finally, the biggest market gap is the high cost and high risk. 
uh, unfortunately, current vehicles, electric vehicles are currently four times more uh, expensive compared to the diesel or even biogas. And even relatively, if I may say, wealthy entities like Oslo and Helsinki do not think it would be possible for them to purchase new vehicles in the short term. So in the latest contract, and, and this was the case also for other cities when they, they do the tendering, uh, usually the offer that they receive is mainly biogas at the moment because of this higher cost. So this is really the, something we will have to address. And I know that in countries like Germany, for example, where they have provided quite a lot of support in terms of tax uh, rebate, then it is a possibility to advance further. So this was really a snap. Uh, you can see quite a lot in the, in the documents that are available on the Big Buyers website. And this is us at the IFAT fair, so it's a technology fair, where we've really done quite a lot of all this uh, company's uh, market dialogue and understanding of the current vehicles on the market. And if you want to know, know more, are invited to get, I invite you to get in contact with me or visit the current Big Buyers website until it is still there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Many thanks, Anya, for uh, this uh, presentation, which was very, very clear and raised a lot of uh, interesting uh, questions about the experience and the work carried out by the group. I will now pass the floor to Peter to hear about uh, the experience from Gothenburg. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> I'm going to share some of our experiences uh, concerning electric trucks. <clears throat> You have to excuse me because I got a little of a cold, but I think I, it will work anyhow. Uh, I work uh, at a part of uh, the city of Gothenburg uh, that's called Sustainable Waste and Water. It's, it's a department in the city. Uh, so we take care of uh, waste, we produce water and take care of the sewage uh, in the city and uh, we have uh, some kind of motto that says that we make it easy to live sustainable uh, so that's uh, one part of the thing that drive us to work with electric trucks uh, the waste department uh, is Anya uh, noticed uh, so some cities don't buy the trucks themselves. We are among them. Uh, we uh, procure the collection of waste, uh, but uh, in those procurements, we are rather specific what type of trucks and the demands for different trucks. Uh, is, so we are. Uh, making uh, the entrepreneurs to make the right things. Uh, we started 2015 and said that uh, it should be fossil free. Uh, so uh, most of the trucks have gone earlier on HVO 100 or biogas. We also have a lot of different environmental restrictions when it comes to tires, motor oil, hydraulic oils and so on. But uh, that we should talk about electrification. We started uh, the year of 2016. Uh, we had a meeting with Volvo Trucks that had their head office in our city. And uh, we had a good contact with them before. We had the rumor about uh, they are going to make electric trucks. And we said that the first electric truck you will uh, make and should be a waste truck made for the city of Gothenburg. And uh, they said yes to that. So this is the first electric uh, Volvo truck and it's our first electric waste truck. It was presented in 2018, but uh, it wasn't really uh, ready to go on the streets. Uh, but uh, from the spring 2019, it has worked perfect. It's a uh, 16 tons to Excel Volvo. We learned a lot of these uh, trucks. And as Anya mentioned before, 
analyzing and planning is crucial uh, because the first generation of battery that was on this truck, for example, it was uh, every unit had a capacity of um, 50 or exactly 49 kilowatt hours. And we had three packages of this. Uh, each weighs about 500 and kilo. So we had um, to take a uh, route uh, for the waste collection uh, that could work with this battery. And um, as we uh, already wanted it to drive in the city of Gothenburg, uh, it, it didn't drive so many miles. Uh, so we thought it should work. And it did. Uh, but uh, of course, it has some uh, restrictions. You couldn't uh, uh, drive it, it away to put, take, uh, for example, extra bins or so. It, uh, it has to go strictly to its planned route because it was optimized for that. The drivers love the truck. Uh, I'm very happy with it. And they said that uh, they, um, uh, come to to learn uh, one another much more because they could speak all the day and not as with the diesel trucks where they have to be quiet or maybe sometimes yell to each other uh, now they could just talk both when we're outside working empty bins and when they were driving and then most of all they was not tired when the uh, day was over because uh, they had uh, not all the noise in their e ears. And uh, it operated as we had hoped um, for several years. Well then, in, in that time, 2018, we was uh, writing a procurement for collection of waste, uh, waste in one fourth of Gothenburg, the southwest part. And uh, as you saw, the first truck uh, was going from 2019. We had no experience of how this will work, but we said uh, still that um, you should have at least five electric heavy trucks in this part, uh, in this contract. And uh, uh, the rest of the trucks should be biogas. The contract started 2020 and they got those five trucks that you see up to the right. It's uh, four, three XL, 27 tons trucks and one distribution trucks as they use for uh, when they are changing bins or uh, delivering sacks and things like that. Uh, uh, some more about this uh, first, uh, as there was just one uh, quick charger in the city and it was a rather long way from the area where these high trucks should operate. Uh, we said from the start that you had to plan for night charging and that the trucks uh, should do its full work uh, with only night charging. And we started to have a discussion with the city and uh, did what we could to make a quick load station also in this part. Uh, but uh, of different reasons, we don't have it yet. Uh, so that has been a big problem uh, because uh, the trucks have worked very fine. Uh, for night charging, but of course I had to plan the routes for it. Uh, but uh, in, for example, uh, last uh, winter there were uh, some weeks that were rather cold and then they couldn't uh, drive the whole route. Uh, so it's crucial to know what you have to do. Uh, and I can also say, uh, Anja was a little 
negative about the batteries. As I, as we said, the first trucks truck was uh, 50 kilowatts per unit. Uh, but of these five, the first two have the same batteries, but the last three delivered had a, um, they have raised the uh, capacity to 66 kilowatt hours per unit uh, of the same weight and size. Uh, so that's a big improvement. And if you buy a Volvo now, you can get up to 19 kilowatt hours per unit. Uh, so the range uh, question is a, a diminishing problem, I will say. On this, uh, there are four of these um, battery. Uh, so it's a rather good prestanda. But still, you have to plan how to use it. We also, uh, because of the limited range of the battery driven trucks, we rather early started to discuss what shall we do uh, when the batteries um, is not good enough for outskirt parts of Gothenburg, for example. And uh, so we, we said that uh, probably we will have hydro uh, battery trucks in the city and hydrogen trucks in the outskirts. Uh, so we managed to um, be involved in a project uh, and built one hydrogen truck together with Scania. And this is it. And it has been very much a problem before it was uh, ready uh, as there were different companies that have uh, divided responsibility for different parts and, and that's not a good thing. Um, but uh, finally they managed to, to make things work and it, it's on the streets now and we hope this will uh, perform very, very good. So hydrogen is interesting, but during the time that uh, we built this truck, we saw the development of the batteries. So the, as I said, the range problem is uh, diminishing, but there are other re reasons to look for hydrogen as I can see it. Uh, and one of them is the capacity of the electric grid. If you will have many trucks and you plan to charge them during the nights, maybe there is not uh, enough of effect in the grid. And uh, then the hydrogen is a solution uh, to have electric trucks, uh, but not have to charge them as much. So uh, today we have uh, in, in our city eight battery trucks and one hydrogen truck that are going on the streets and working very well. But we had one fast charger, as I said, and just one filling station for hydrogen. Yes. So uh, it's rather difficult, uh, but there are new the charging station coming and also there are plans to build at least two more filling stations for hydrogen uh, during this year. So we hope this will uh, uh, start uh, driving the development further on uh, rather soon. And more to come, we are planning for um, for more electric trucks and boats. Uh, I'm I have been working with a recycling station uh, floating on the river. And uh, from this spring, the, the tugboat will be electrified. Uh, we'll have two more hydrogen waste trucks, uh, 18 tons and one hydrogen driven forklift also. And we are in these days, starting to work with the next uh, big pr procurement uh, where the contract will start 2025. 
and there will be at least 15 waste trucks. Uh, we haven't decided if we will uh, demand all of them be electric or not, but uh, it's uh, questions we discuss uh, right now. But uh, most of them will definitely be electric. So uh, just some conclusion as we have worked with this. You can say that um, battery trucks are less, still less expensive than the hydrogen. Uh, and it's better infrastructure, even if it's not as good as we hoped. And the energy efficiency of, is of course bet, better for batteries. You lose uh, some energy uh, converting to hydrogen. And uh, you have to make a lot of analyzing before buying the trucks just to know that you have the right uh, optimal uh, combination of battery capacity and payload. The cons of hydrogen is, of course, longer range. And one uh, big thing uh, that the drivers are uh, very anxious about, uh, to fill a hydrogen truck it goes as fast as filling up a diesel truck, uh, instead of maybe half an hour or 45 minutes to recharge uh, a battery truck during lunchtime. Uh, so you can also get better payload from the hydrogen trucks, but it's very expensive. Yeah, that was uh, a short version of what we have done in Gothenburg so far. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Peter, for your presentation. It's very interesting because on the one side, there have been many challenges, and on the other side, which were highlighted by Anya. On the other side, Peter, you have been already showing some positive developments and also the alternative uh, which is provided by, by hydrogen. Now, um, just to start the second part of our webinar and have some questions, I will just kick off the discussion. Maybe I will start with Anya. Uh, you have been mentioning the, the added value of the collaboration. How you have been seeing the work uh, evolving the last uh, three years uh, in, in that respect? Yeah, so hello everyone. Indeed, that, uh, what uh, one of the biggest challenges was indeed was COVID that provided quite a lot of uh, issues in relation to the, to the supply chain. So it, the market is potentially ready, but uh, that's why what we have identified in the, in the market gaps document that there are still quite some challenges. So uh, what, what we have seen at the moment is, is ambitious cities uh, like, like the city of Gothenburg or Copenhagen that are really driving the way. But for mass rollout all over Europe, really without distinctions, uh, we, we still need uh, we still need to wait for additional technological development, uh, some <laughs> some additional development, uh, for example, on batteries. This is what the buyers have told me, Peter. I haven't, uh, um, and also we need to 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 wait for further development, particularly in relation to recharging infrastructure. Concerning the question on the on the kilometer, I really invite you to to check the um, the entrance project because they were the one that support us in this market analysis, and they have developed this list of vehicles with all the specification. However, what is to be noticed, the specification are always the one provided by the supplier. And sometimes that, of course, do not correspond to, they might not correspond to the use because the use is affected by a number of, um, of geographical condition or condition related to the, the driver. For example, if you have the heating on in the cabin, uh, you might have, of course, then less possibility in terms of kilometer or depending what you're transporting. Hope I satisfied your question. Many thanks, Anya, maybe. Also, I have another small question for uh, for Peter uh, before passing to the question for, for Slido. Um, <clears throat> let me also remind that, unfortunately, due to the connection difficulties uh, in, uh, in Gothenburg, uh, we are not able to, to see Peter on the screen, but only the, the indication that he's uh, speaking. So the question for Peter is, uh, 
uh, what was also your experience with regard to after sales support, uh, um, both in the electric and eventually also in the in the hydrogen one? Okay, for for the uh, battery trucks uh, made by Volvo, there has been no problem because we have the both the factory and good service organization around in Gothenburg, and as uh, especially the the first one they were eager to to see that it works uh, so we have a very good uh, support for that one and the hydrogen truck is uh, a little more uh, tricky uh, but um, uh, Scania has also good service organization in in Gothenburg and the fuel cell is made by Parcel what which also is a company located in Gothenburg. Uh, so we have it rather good in that way. I can also uh, say about the question Anja got about the kilometers. The first uh, uh, truck uh, we made, we have the uh, demand for that it should run 80 kilometers for one day. And, and that uh, has worked. I think the Newer ones that uh, the uh, the five trucks uh, in 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 the contract uh, with four battery pack of a uh, high standard they go up to 120 kilometers uh, in right conditions. There was more questions um, I saw about hydrogen trucks. Then we have another question. How can exceptions to the EU public contractors directive be managed? I mean, in the case of direct purchasing mentioned by the first speakers, so to Anya, if it entails a negotiated procedure without publicity, it must be clearly and thoroughly justified. So, Anya, this is for you, if you could uh, take it, please. Yes. So, I, I will say straight away that I'm not an expert in, in this specific uh, legislation. Maybe actually colleagues from the GGRO might say a lot more, but this is an exception because of innovation products. So, uh, Rotterdam has been purchasing one product at the time. Uh, so they were able to go directly to the supplier that they, they wanted to purchase from uh, without a negotiated procedure or they've done this, this mini tender where only two, three suppliers were informed. And this is because it's an exception related to innovation. But you can only purchase one vehicle at a time and this is because you want to test it how it does perform. I, I think Ivo... Uh, would you, do you want to compliment on this? Because I'm sure you know a lot more <laughs> than I. I think that we are in the context of, of below threshold procedure. I think this is, uh, this is fine. Of course, for a larger uh, procurement, we would uh, really go for uh, more uh, open <laughs> possibilities uh, or, or also other type of, of procedure, which offer also more transparency. We can also go ahead with other questions. I see another questions which is very interesting, again, from Carlos Garcia. I pass the floor to Pietro to read it. Yes. So it seems clear that contracting out vehicle development and testing will not be enough. Perhaps a bundled tender, including infrastructure, development, and innovative full life cycle support, including maintenance service, would be needed. For example, innovative supply plus service contract, right? I would address this uh, to, to Peter. Okay, uh, I can say that uh, both Volvo and Scania offers a full service uh, contract uh, uh, type of leasing uh, where all the support is included. Um, uh, but uh, the infrastructure uh, is uh, a bigger problem to include in the procurements, I think. And because it's um, the energy companies that uh, would uh, supply the, the quick uh, loading stations, they want to see it 
uh, more flexible and and don't uh, build things for just a few trucks. But the uh, the the infrastructure for night charging can be de delivered by both the Volvo and Scania. So uh, if if you want to, so you it's possible for those companies at least that's the only two i have experience of to make the full uh, system in one contract okay thank you we have another question for anya since the zero emission waste trucks are not entirely market ready do the OEMs mandate costly monthly maintenance slash service contracts? Yeah. Um, so in the case of Rotterdam, and I'm not sure, Peter, if it's also your case, that the vehicles that were provided are all original equipment manufacturing. So they were uh, built for the purpose of the specific tendering, uh, uh, the specific features that were demanded by the, by the criteria tendering contract. Maybe I should specify that when it comes to maintenance, uh, is not that it's not part of the contract. It is part of the contract. It's just that it's very it's difficult on how you provide it, depending on the specific circumstances. As, as Peter currently pointed out, the fact that the company um, Volvo is very near to the city, it does provide a little bit easier access uh, to to after sale support compared to the case like we have seen in Portugal, where the manufacturer will need to subcontract it to another company that maybe is not completely ready or does not have currently the skills to provide such a service. So this is what we have seen. Another case is, um, and this was the case of Harlem in the Netherlands, what they are doing, they are running their own training of skills. So if they decided to, to counterpass the issue related to maintenance and after sales support, but they're investing quite a lot in training of the of the people that are running the vehicles. That of course, this is also another solution. However, it can be time consuming, it can be very costly, uh, but it could be another opportunity for, for, for entities. Uh, um, it's just that we have really noticed this difference in approach between especially the Netherlands and Germany, uh, and in the case of Sweden and other countries where the company might not have already put in place an after sales support. And it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, sometimes uh, you will not put in, a company will not put in place an after sales support if they have not done sales. Uh, and on the other hand, the entity will not purchase a vehicle if they don't have the certainty of the after sales support in case of uh, technical issue. Thank you. We have another question for Peter. How long does it take to charge the vehicles? Uh, the night uh, charging as it works uh, today, uh, for uh, what I know, the first of the trucks is uh, five to seven hours uh, during the night uh, from empty to full, if I say so. Um, but if you have, it's different if you have uh, many trucks, uh, you have, have to have a system that distributes uh, energy in a special manner. You can't uh, load all trucks at the same time. Uh, so it could take a little longer time uh, for the whole fleet. And, uh, and uh, charging if, if you have a quick charger and they want to fill up the energy during the day. If you say have 40% left and, and you say you want it up to at least 80%, uh, it, it can take uh, from 20 minutes to half an hour. Then we have a general question. I will be interested to at least follow this project. Where do I need to sign up to get notified? I think that I, I will uh, mention this in, uh, in my uh, next slides. Uh, maybe uh, we can move uh, to this slide so that I can uh, move to the third part of our webinar and introduce uh, elements regarding the follow-up project and the next uh, Big Buyers uh, project. Uh, so. 
we are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, now um, signed a contract for a big scale up of the existing, uh, of the past project, which was a pilot. Since it was successful, it was decided to scale it up to have 10 working groups from four. The macro areas are decided uh, by us, at the, by the Commission, so we will have six working groups which will working and supporting the digital and green transition. One of these will be specifically related to the procurement of IT. Two working groups will be in the field of health, health procurement, a very important part of public procurement uh, takes place in the health field. And two, this is a new extension of the Big Bias project, will cover issues related to social procurement. The only other uh, relevant indications which we give a top down is that two working groups must be relevant for the U new European Bauhaus uh, and uh, one also must be relevant for decarbonization mobility, for example. This was the case of today's webinar. Also, the working groups will be hosted in the digital platform, which is about to be launched, uh, which includes a public space a forum and also a number of communities of practice. And each of these working group will be a community of practice under the digital platform. How does the pro project work? And uh, here I, I also answer to the <coughs> question which was raised. Well, the contractor will uh, carry out a thorough needs assessment, uh, which takes place uh, normally via questionnaire and also a number of interviews in order to check the actual engagement of the buyers in the activities. There are activities which relate to uh, collaboration and, uh, and um, organizational meeting, uh, webinars, uh, um, market, uh, and which lead essentially to an exchange of best practices, market intelligence, joint um, uh, market dialogues, preparation um, of all the buyers together, of the market dialogues, of the meetings with the uh, suppliers. Uh, and also preparing, let's say, the scaling up of the of the um, work from pilots to more advanced projects. The, uh, also the traveling expenditures which uh, relate to the participation to physical uh, meetings is also refunded. So all buyers taking part in the project will have their cost to, uh, fully, uh, fully covered. Uh, then if we go to the next one, uh, next slide, there are also a number of new activities which are uh, which we have included into this uh, um, new project and this includes hackathons learning expeditions more challenging or pitching events and also virtual meetings with all the decision makers of public buyers participating in the big buyers network all of it essentially is really to uh, close as much as possible the gap between the innovation ecosystem and the uh, demand which is expressed by the uh, buyers, the public buyers taking part in the project. Next slide, please. Uh, so we also have another uh, other two webinars, uh, which um, which are planned between uh, uh, in April and May. The first one will uh, concern the results of the working group on circular construction, which focused on asphalt. This is planned for the 25th of April. The second one will be the launch of new calls for expression of interest to join the big buyers community and will take place on the 30th of May. And also here we will, be, for example, be able to um, present and discuss the potential in areas which, uh, uh, which will be covered by the new project, like, for example, social procurement or, again, health. Finally, also a little bit of information of other, uh, other, other activities that we carry out, which can be useful to participants in this webinar. The, green and pro the GPP, so the Green Public Procurement and Socially Responsible Help Desk. And here you find the contact uh, details uh, of the Help Desk, uh, which also provides for important uh, news alert and newsletter and organizes a number of webinars, like those mentioned here in the slide. We have also a newsletter, which is the, the best way to uh, be kept up to date with regard to uh, webinars, funding, infor funding opportunities, projects, regulatory developments about public procurement. Our newsletter is called the Public Procurement Gazette. If you are interested, you can subscribe to the link, which will be sent in the slides, or if you want, you can also send a mail to our 
uh, mailbox, which you find here at the bottom of the slides. Um, there are also two other ways to keep up to date to our work, which is to subscribe to the LinkedIn groups on innovation procurement and on social procurement, which are mentioned here. Also, um, of course, there is our website. And finally, all our webinars are stored and saved in our uh, YouTube channel. There are more than 20 webinars nowadays, and I invite you to, to browse there. And with this, we have concluded uh, our uh, presentation. Uh, in case you have, uh, want to contact us, also we, there are in the slide um, the relevant uh, functional mailbox. I hope you find it interesting, and uh, many thanks for your participation. Thank you.